Good morning, my name is Ernest and I will be today's webinar moderator. Welcome to the Cano ACIO webinar, updates on cancer immunotherapy hosted by Merck Canada and presented by Massey Nematolahi. Massey is a certified oncology nurse from Cano and ONS. She currently works as a clinical nurse specialist at William Ulcer Health System in Brampton, Ontario, where she runs an immuno-oncology clinic under Dr. Parneet Chima's leadership, where she educates and monitors all the patients starting on cancer immunotherapy. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly go over the format of this webinar. There will be two parts, a 45-minute presentation segment and a 15-minute question and answer session. You may post written questions during the webinar using the chat box located beside the slides. Questions will be answered in the subsequent Q&A session. At this time, I would like to present to you today's speaker. Massey, you may begin your presentation. Okay, again, hello and thank you everyone for attending. I would like to thank Merck for sponsoring this session. My name is Massey and uh, I am very positive that I know most of you attending the call. So thank you so much for spending an hour with me to go through the updates on cancer immunotherapy. The time is really tight. I can talk more than four hours about all the new things and what is happening at Osler. But uh, for the sake of time, I will try to manage that in an hour or actually 45 minutes. And at the end, there will be a, a question and answer session. So I don't go through the objectives. You have seen that on the CANO website. Uh, mostly we will make sure that everyone is aware of the immuno-oncology clinic and the processes that is happening at Osler. Nothing to disclose related to this talk. So pillars of cancer treatment, now indeed immunotherapy is one of them and it is very important to understand that this is uh, indeed a magical seasoning to all the cancer treatments that we have right now. We are combining that with surgery, radiation, systemic therapies, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and more importantly, chemotherapy. Most of you that are familiar with immunotherapy, you know that we do have now triplet of combination of chemo and immunotherapy. So this is the way that the practice is really changing and we have to make sure we have a proper education and patient management for these new treatment modalities. So looking at this slide, I just want to quickly compare the chemotherapy and immunotherapy adverse events. So we all know that nausea, vomiting, or bone marrow suppression, as you can see on chemotherapy, are very common on cytotoxic therapies. Things like platinum-based treatment. It is very common and we are all very familiar with that. Um, this toxicity from chemotherapy are usually uh, due to the drug effects on the healthy tissue and are usually dependent on the dose of that agent. But when we look at the cancer immunotherapy side effects, they are so unique. We never have like uh, colitis or endocrinopathies with chemotherapy. So these are really unique side effects that you can see. But what is important here is we do get actually some of these side effects common in both chemotherapy and immunotherapy. But what is important here is to understand that the, uh, there is immunologic etiology for immune checkpoint inhibitors versus for chemotherapy that is different. That is just the underlying pathogenic mechanism of that treatment. So if we understand that, for example, for chemotherapy, what chemotherapy will do will cause the death of the intestinal epithelial cells versus with like the diarrhea, for example, with that is because of the imbalance between the absorption and secretion in the, in the small bowel. But looking at the diarrhea uh, from a resulting of immunotherapy, that is so different. That's just due to an immune reaction to the gut associated or self antigen. So knowing that we may have diarrhea from chemo and IO, and if I mention IO, I mean immunotherapy, so it will be quicker, so I will save time. 
This, uh, they may have common side effects, but just understanding that they, they all need an appropriate management based on their mechanism of action. So, points to remember, chemo side effects are predictable and the onset is related to the treatment time. We all know how to educate our patients about immunotherapy, about chemotherapy, um, and tell them when, when you're going to get tired, immunosuppression, losing your hair, and so on. But immunotherapy side effects are indeed unpredictable. It can occur anytime during the treatment, even post discontinuation. So I have a question for you, and I would like to ask Ernest to pull the question, if you don't mind. It's not examining uh, your knowledge. It's just for my understanding what is happening in different centers. Thank you, Massey. I will launch the poll now. So all webinar participants, you may now select an answer and then hit submit. We'll give everyone 30 seconds to one minute and then we'll, we will close the poll. Okay, it looks like we've received everyone's vote. Wow, thank you, everyone. So I will now show the results. So based on the results, it appears that most people are somewhat comfortable with managing um, while, while there are quite a few who are comfortable as well. So I will now hide the results. Massey, you may continue your presentation. Okay, that is, that is wonderful. You know what, I really like the somewhat answer because it is one of the best and safest answers that you can give. And it is indeed somewhat is a very correct answer because immunotherapy adverse events are really unpredictable and you will always be surprised with what uh, will happen to our patients because some of these side effects are really rare and we may not have had that experience with that. So uh, mo um, moving forward to the presentation, I would just like to touch on the cancer immunity cycle which some of you may have heard or seen this slide before, but in order to uh, understand that, you have to uh, know the tumor and tumor microenvironment. And this is the seven stepwise events that will lead to the effective killing of the cancer cells. So starting from step one, you will see that the antigen that will be uh, created by the tumor formation will be released and will be captured on step two by dendritic cells or APC antigen presenting cells. I call dendritic cells the gatekeepers of the immune system. And then the mm, APCs will link the innate immune system to adaptive immune response. And mostly these dendritic cells are concentrated in the secondary lymphoid tissues like, for example, spleen or the lymph nodes. So then dendritic cells, when they present the cancer antigen to the T cells, then we will move to step four because it will result to priming and activating of the T cell. The activated T cell then on the step five will uh, travel to the tumor and infiltrate the tumor microenvironment or the tumor bed, you can call it. And then after that, we'll recognize the cells, the cancer cells, and step seven will kill the cancer cells. So these seven steps is, is the cancer immunity cycle. And again, after that, again, the killing of the cancer cell releases again additional tumor associated antigen. We'll go back to the step one, the cycle continues. Uh, different treatments actually target the different steps which will promote the activity of the cancer immunity cycle. 
anti-CTLA-4, cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated antigen 4, anti-PD program death ligand and program death 1. These are mostly they are primarily promote different steps of cancer immunity cycle and that is important to understand because for those of us that are working in the infusion center I and mean, you have a patient after completion of a combination of immunotherapy combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 and the patient starting cycle two will ask you everything went well I really didn't have any problem but for example, Massey told me about all these scary side effects, nothing happened to me. You will remember your patient is receiving an, a combination of IO and then usually they crash cycle two or cycle three. So please remind the patient again, just emphasize the education right there when you are treating your patients that be careful again things may, may change it doesn't mean that you didn't have the side effects at the first cycle and you will not have that again so anything happens as it happens please inform us so emphasizing education at each treatment is extremely important talking about immunity cycle now we are moving to the basis of immune related adverse events. So we are promoting with these treatments, the T cell activation, but the activation of our immune system or the T cell cannot just be confined to the anti-tumor effects and this amplification will cause autoimmunity. And with that autoimmunity, that is what we will see all different itises and opities. These pictures are from the real world study that we are doing on immunotherapy and they are all the patients at Osler. So we know that inflammatory nature of IRAE will cause all these different side effects. Most of them actually are low grade and manageable, easy. With the experience that we have gained through the years, we know how to manage them. And for having a guideline would be an early recognition, a proper patient education, if it is low grade, symptomatic and topical steroids uh, or therapies. And then if it is persistent low grade or severe side effects, we need systemic steroids. We have to make sure that we will not delay that because delaying that means the symptom will get worse and we will have life-threatening side effects or adverse events which one of them is bowel perforation which for the last 15 years I have seen only one bowel perforation because of the delayed on the reporting of the diarrhea slash colitis one thing i want to mention here is that the term irae immune related adverse events has not really consistently described in clinical trials or in any literature. But for the purpose of this uh, presentation today, I will just mention that IRAE, it is any toxicity with a potential immune mediated etiology. And that may or may not really require using any immune modulating therapy like steroids. So that is something that I want you to keep in mind. I promise to myself, one or maximum two slides. I just want to go through that very quickly and I have to be really at her and mindful of the time. So the GI inflammation, so it's all the inflammatory pattern, right? So the colitis, diarrhea slash colitis is something that is common, especially when you are combining two treatments. And if we don't get on the ball at the right time, it can be also life-threatening. You have to treat that very differently from chemotherapy. The patients will report the symptoms of abdominal cramp, bloating, diarrhea, watery bowel movements, blood on, or mucus in the stool, and abdominal pain. And in some of the cases, we have seen a lot of nausea and vomiting. So if that happens and the patient is on chemotherapy also, we have to make sure we will ask them the right questions about the side effects that can be also IO related. And one other thing that is a big flag is waking up middle of the night and go to the bathroom and then have that watery bowel movements, which is not really common on chemotherapy induced diarrhea. So we evaluate the patients, we bring back the patients to the clinic, um, or if they if it is happening during the night, the, the night they have the guides, what they have to do. So we will, of course, like any other centers, we do all the uh, three different stool samples. And uh, 
abdominal, um, just plain abdominal x-ray um, or ultrasound if needed. Uh, the patient will be booked through IO clinic for, for a scope. And the good thing, we want to rule out any other etiology first. We want to make sure the patient has not changed any medication, is not overdosed himself or herself with any um, stool softener or had a basket of cherry and then now have diarrhea. So make sure we will rule out any other etiology and then we will manage the diarrhea. Supportive care, of course, um, loperamide, anti-diarrheal treatment, immunosuppressant, uh, we will start with high dose of steroids, and then if it is steroid refractory, we will move to infliximab. But the patients will be close, will be followed very closely in our IO clinic. Thyroid, thyroid uh, inflammation, thyroiditis is one of the common ones that you will see in your patients. And this is one of those unique toxicity, you will never see that in cytotoxic agents, right? So the key, uh, point here is it is medically managed, so you do not have to stop the treatment. You can still continue the treatment with uh, thyroiditis. And typically, patients start with hyper and then notice, and then uh, during that phase, you will see um, the TSH level will go lower and lower. And at this stage, we no uh, note that most of the patients are asymptomatic. Almost all of them are asymptomatic. Rarely you will hear a family member calls with irritability and nervousness. I just don't know why his mood is changed. So you know that the patient is on hyperthyroidism state. But it will rebound very quickly by the time you get the patient back to the clinic and then do the TSH. You will see the TSH is really high now because it is trying to stimulate the thyroid function. Patient will be very, very tired and they really can't do anything. But the good thing is that just we will replace the hormone, which is levothyroxine, and the patient will very quickly recover. Skin infl inflammation is the another um, side effect, dermatitis. You have seen that all a lot. And again, these are the pictures from our signed consent form patients that they allowed us to have their pictures here. This happens very fast, like the patient at the bottom on um, anti-PD-1 inhibitor just calls you that I have some itchiness and within two days the patient calls and rash is everywhere. So the patient calls that I have rash inside, but there is not, sorry, I have itchiness inside my body, but there is nothing outside. So this is the way that people will report that. So you have to just think about the treatment and the combination or chemo and IO, and then start to think about bringing the patient in. And it's always very good to take pictures for your um, all case studies you want to present to your team. Usually the combination, they have more um, um, incident of uh, dermatitis. Of course, we will rule out the etiology. A patient just called and said, I just had an allergic reaction to the um, tape after the CT scan. I think that that is about that because it is just at that area. It is just an incident, but that was just rash. It wasn't the allergic reaction and they haven't changed their diet. They haven't changed anything, any food allergy. So we have to rule out any other etiology and based on that, start their right treatment. So steroids is the cornerstone managing that. And uh, usually, or almost we have to slow taper that, definitely not less than four weeks, we all know that. And we have learned that we're treating uh, almost 200, 198 patients actually in our clinic. Uh, we have learned the importance of slow tapering because when we are on high dose and then you start to taper that within three days to five days, and then a weekly, three days this week, five days next week. And as soon as they hit 25 or 30 milligram, again, it flares and then you have to go back to the same high dose. So slow taper is something that we really experienced a lot in the clinic to make sure that that tapering is happening properly. And then again, we do have patients that they are uh, steroid refractory based on the um, IRAE. We will start them on um, infleximab or um, mycophenolate if they have hepatitis. Endocrinopathy is, is something that you all have to remember to tell to the patients that that hormone replacement is going to be lifelong replacement. 
So the immune checkpoint inhibitors in patients with autoimmune disease. So that is something that is always a question. Is it really safe to, to do that or not? I remember 15 years ago, everyone was so scared. And when I was doing clinical trials, we knew that it is an absolute um, exclusion criteria, actually. So nobody with immune or autoimmune disease could go on any immunotherapy. But having said that, um, we have gained a lot of experience. Everyone is now more braver. And yes, all the literature, CT and NCC and guidelines recommend that ICI, immune checkpoint inhibitors, may be considered in patients with autoimmune disorder. But for example, patients with IBD, patients with uh, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroiditis, Crohn. We do have all these cases on immunotherapy in our clinic. But the most important point here for you to know is, first of all, understand what is that immune autoimmune disease and how well is it controlled? The patients may have uh, psoriasis or RA or IBD, that very common IBD or Crohn. And oh, for the last 15 years, I had absolutely no flare or a patient that constantly have intermittent diarrhea. So it's important to understand how well that autoimmune disease is, is uh, controlled and how is it impacting the patient's life. Ask the patients about the level of their pain if they have RA. Ask the patients about their bowel movements pattern if they have IBD and when was the last uh, flare. So of course, these cases also need to have <clears throat> interprofessional approach for baseline. From the baseline, we, we refer the patients to our multidisciplinary team to know the patients from the very beginning and knowing that they are starting immunotherapy and we follow the patients very closely. Keep in mind that there is absolutely no immune checkpoint inhibitor for patients with autoimmune neurologic or neuromuscular disease. The next question that I thought uh, it is important for us to know is a challenging uh, with re-challenging IRAs. So what are the challenges here? Are we really going to re-challenge the patients who had grade two or grade three colitis and then everything is subsided now or rash dermatitis? How does that one work? So uh, looking at uh, all different retro retrospective data, they all suggest that immune-related adverse events and the safety and retreating is probably depend on the severity of that initial IRAE. So for example, if you have a patient had grade three rash, and these are all real, real life world examples I'm giving to you, patients on combination of immunotherapy and had grade three rash, after two cycles of treatment, we usually don't jump to combination again when we start cycle three. And the uh, and, and, uh, um, theory here tells us that after two treatments of combination, you usually trained the T cells. They are well trained to, to do the job that they have to do. They are educated and graduated. So you really don't have to uh, put the patients at the risk of, again, the toxicity, but we definitely continue with one. For those patients that they have only monotherapy of immune checkpoint inhibitors, again, depends on the severity. We continue, we re-challenge the patients for sure. We know the patient is responding well. If it is something that we are just still want to think about, is there any changes? Is it really good to try or not? And I will give you another live example. I mean, real example. A patient on anti-PD-1 inhibitor, um, stage four non-small cell lung cancer patients had one cycle of treatment. Patient had history of IBD. After cycle one, patient had grade three diarrhea. Um, we stopped the treatment, but with the discussion, very important to talk to the patients about the challenges. We, we started the second cycle of the treatment. The patients wanted to try that one more time and then see how, because it was very comfortable to manage the IBD. But with that flare, 
the patient was lost what to do. She wanted to have another treatment and we monitored the patients very carefully, had again grade two diarrhea. We managed that, but guess what? The immunotherapy stopped after two cycles, but a 76 years old lovely lady, the immune system is already educated and the cancer is completely under control. Most of the liver lesions are disappeared. The, the T cells, they know what to do. Okay, Ernest, how about another question now? Will you please pull that question? Certainly. Here we go. The question is now on the screen. This time it is a multiple choice question. Um, you can select multiple answers. Sorry, we don't have any any Jeopardy music for you here. That's okay. It looks like we have a lot of activity. People are still answering the question. We'll give the audience another 15 more seconds. Okay, I will now close the poll and show the results. Here we are. Messi, do you see the results? I don't, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Well, I will read them to you then. So the, the selection with the most responses are pharmaceutical companies at 80%. The second one is in-house at 67%. And then Slight, a little further behind are multiple multidisciplinary partners, and then the last two um, have lower responses. So I will now give the screen back to you. Okay, thank you very much. So that is very very interesting. So maybe maybe I have to say thank you to all the pharmaceuticals that have created uh, great tools and resources, and again the the work that has happened in uh, in the IO clinic at Brampton, um, we are so grateful from all the pharmaceuticals that have supported the, this program and has helped us to create all the resources, tools and materials and the videos that I'm going to share with you right now. So yes, we are so proud to have the first immunotherapy clinic in Canada and it has started two years ago and um, uh, the foundation of the program actually, we just want to make sure that the patients get the right education and uh, we're able to enhance also the monitoring of the patients, especially those at high risk and get involved the interprofessional team to be our partner because this is absolutely not a one-man show knowing that these T-cells get overactive in all the organs. We need a multidisciplinary team to help us. And of course, whatever we will do to share with other centers, we definitely did not uh, um, create the, the wheel for most parts we did, but for some of them, we just reached out to CITC, NCCN, ASCO guidelines, all different valid, reliable guidelines to make sure what is the best. And with the experience that we gained in the clinic, we have modified anything that is needed to be done. So the goal of the OSIP, which is Osler Cancer Immunotherapy Program, is have a proper patient education. So we need materials, we need resources, tools, videos, and everything, posters, to make sure that that education is happening. So with that, we need to be able to recognize these side effects and symptoms and adverse events very early in order to manage them and be able to put the patients back on the treatment and monitor them very closely, not only the weekly call, but as an oncology nurse, we all know there are some of the patients that are maybe only on monotherapy, but you feel like you have to call the patient. So we do have the, that opportunity in this clinic to follow most of our patients very closely. And of course, the team collaboration with our multidisciplinary 
uh, physicians. So the clinic is led by Dr. Chima. Most of you have met her or know about her. So she is the leader and she's the one who approached me to start this uh, very innovative program. And I was honored to come to Osler and work with her and Osler family to run such a clinic. Um, an immunotherapy nurse specialist will focus on education, monitoring the side effects, and will collaborate with all the subspecialists to manage these AEs and send the referrals as needed. And the program will have lots of proactive callbacks and all the patients will be followed. High risk patients will be identified and followed with weekly call for at least 20 weeks from the day they start the treatment. And we have created also the pathways. So uh, through the help of the subspecialists that how and how we have to walk through that path to make sure the patients are safe. And that is indeed possible because we can keep the patients out of the hospital. So identify a patient educator. For those of you who have seen me before, that is me. If this picture is not 100 years old, it is maybe a couple of months ago, but I have to tell you, I have aged a lot since then. And then the new patient education program. So for that, the first thing that we thought is really, really important is a baseline assessment. How we have to assess these patients when a doctor referred a patient to the clinic or email or put that in my grid that I'm starting so and so on immunotherapy. So I have to be prepared with a proper assessment not to miss anything. And right there is when I will identify any high risk patients. It's not something that always the doctors will tell you, but with your proper assessment, you will find that out. So I have just put a bits and pieces of this checklist here. Sorry, that list is so a um, couple of uh, pages and I just could not put that all here in this small slide. But we go through everything from the baseline lab oxygen saturation, which is extremely important when you have a case of pneumonitis. Sitting and walking oxygen saturation is vital and make sure that the doctors, they have not missed any lab work with the help of our nurse educator at oncology clinic at Osler, we have created a baseline IO panel and follow up IO panel based on a combination of treatment or monotherapy. So the doctor will just tick mark that and that will be ordered online and then everything will be there. Sometimes still we miss some of this blood work and we have to make sure we are not missing anything at the baseline because it is a very valuable reference for you when the patient has any IRAE. Autoimmune disorders is very important to catch at the very beginning, um, especially patients that they come and say, when you go through the list and ask them certain questions and examine them, and then you will find uh, there is a rash or a lesion or uh, some erythema in the leg. Oh, I forgot to say, I have history of psoriasis. So this is something that the doctor has missed and they will capture that right there and we have to wait when it will flare when the patient is on immunotherapy. So high risk patients, uh, as you can see here, some of the patients are not applicable for high risk, but if they are, we definitely do the man to test at the very beginning. And that is important because you are saving time. If the patient is going to be refractory to steroid, you are saving at least 48 hours for that inflammatory process that is happening anywhere in the body, especially in the bowels and we are we have the man to result at the baseline so it's so easy and it is cheap just you have to talk to your pharmacist and add it to your baseline tests medication history we go through that we go through a symptom tracker i'll show that all these slides to you later on but uh, medication reconciliation bpmh will be done by pharmacists we will make sure we will capture if the patient had recent vaccination or if some of the patients they get uh, different vaccination, they get shingle vaccination, they get uh, uh, pneumovax vaccination, not just the flu shot. And we capture all this information for the sake of the IO study that we are doing in the clinic. But it is always good to know if the patient had vaccination or if not, or if they want to have, you can guide them that there is no problem with your vaccination as long as it's not live vaccine. Going through the over-the-counter medications, if they are on any steroids, you have to know there are so many treatments, standard of care treatment for renal cell carcinoma that you start your patients on steroids itself. 
steroids, five milligram, 10 milligram per day, <clears throat> that is all right because it is still your body can produce that amount of steroids. But anything higher than that, you have to contact the physician and make sure that what they want to do about that steroids. Of course, bowel movements habit needs to be, um, to be documented very clearly. And we will go through the checklist of all that education that we have, education pamphlets that we have provided the patients. If they are receiving chemo with that combination, you will tick mark the um, fever part also. And everything is done. That is a documentation for your chart. Either it is EMR or if it is just a paper chart, you have to scan it and you have to keep it in patient's chart. The video is another uh, thing that I'm honestly very proud of that because it took almost a year for us to create something that is very useful for everyone. We have translated that to so many different languages, more languages coming in 2020. And it has been viewed and it has been posted on Lung Cancer Canada, Kidney Cancer Canada, Melanoma Canada or Save Your Skin. And, and Society by uh, Sitsi, uh, the AIM Melanoma also, they have posted that. They love the video, they love the Spanish one because they have a lot of Spanish population there at US. So this is really a viral video. People are using that all the time. We actually had a web designer patient who saw the video the other day and I had no idea what the patient does. Uh, and the patient said, I used to do web design. And I think that has been designed very well. We are really happy about what we have produced. Uh, again, with the support of all uh, different pharmaceuticals, we have it there uh, reviewed by patient advisory council, um, medical oncologists, oncology nurses, and um, um, pharmacies across Canada. So this is something that we really uh, looked at that very carefully in terms of health literacy. Patient education booklet. Again, another thing that is so close to my heart. Finally, it is there. So it is ready. We not only cover cancer immunotherapy, we cover cancer immunotherapy and the chemotherapy because we have a lot of combination now. So both are covered in this booklet and um, you will you will see that uh, you will see all the information there it is for a guide for the patient and the patients that have reviewed this booklet they really like that because you can see the animation in the booklet is the same as the video so in terms of learning style and following the health literacy for the patients it is really very positive and productive uh, the teaching and handouts, we have a lot of them to give to the patients. So what do you have in, in, the, in the corner of that cancer immunotherapy is the folder that uh, we would be very pleased to share that with all the cancer centers. I know in my network out of Canada, there are so many people waiting for this package. So we will share that internationally and we will share that with Canadian sites you just go through the package, whatever works for you, use it, whatever you want to modify, just go ahead and do that. Just want to let you know, this is just an experience of having 200 patients on different immunotherapy, different disease sites. And that was a, a valuable package that we worked very hard to get that out for everyone to use it. How to monitor the patient. So again, finally, again, with the help of our medical oncologist, Dr. Chima, and our uh, nurse educator, her name is Lolita. I just don't know if Lolita is on the, on the call or not, but she is a wonderful educator at Osler. So we just got this medical directive approved. Any lab work that is missed, we are, our ends are able to um, uh, order that. So we will not miss anything at the baseline or in the follow-up or in the monitoring. So these are all the tests and the guideline, what you have to do and how you have to do that. A callback questionnaire in terms that you have a backup in your clinic, they need to know how to run the show. They need to ask the right question. So this is a callback list and it will be again documented in patient's chart. A symptom tracker, again, we will ask in the follow-up phase, we will do that. Patient wallet card, and I know so many organizations, CANO, ONS, NCC, and CITC, all of them, and they do have their own uh, patient wallet card pharmaceuticals. They have their own wallet cards and 
ID bracelet. Some of these bracelets, the patients, they just love it. They come to the infusion unit. I see they have their bracelet. It, it is so lovely to see that they are a big fan of those bracelets. But not everybody likes to have the bracelet. But the wallet card is something that we always ask them. It should be attached to your health card anywhere you go to present that. A letter will be sent to the family doctors um, with the highlight that you can see. It's very small, but you can see that we want them to know that the, the side effects of immunotherapy are different and uh, the treatment choice is high dose of steroids. Multidisciplinary team. Yes, in most of the cancers, not all the academic centers. Uh, all the academic centers may have it, but not other cancer centers like a community hospital will be able to manage all these toxicity. Usually grade one or up to grade one uh, can be managed by oncologists, but it is more than that. You need to get your neurologist, endocrinologist, hepatologist to just jump in and support you. So on December 2018, we got uh, a group of all different uh, ISTs, hepatologists, gastroenterologists, uh, pulmonologists, all your all are multidisciplinary in one room, and we explained who we are, what we are doing, why we need your help. So they are covering the whole catchment area in the limb. So we are um, so uh, fortunate after a really didactic sessions and discussions, they all came up with different ideas how the referral and the pathways needs to be set for different specialists. And this is what we have now at OSIP Network. These are all the physicians in different specialty that are supporting the program. Any referral like this that will go and has the Osler Cancer Immunotherapy Program on the title and refer to the rheumatology, we can click on the name. The name of all the doctors will pop um, and we have different uh, uh, specialty with different reason for referral and the test based on the advice they have given to us. And it will not take a long time. They will see the patients immediately. This is a sample of the OSIP pathway for colitis. And I don't uh, talk a lot about that because I have to make sure you have enough time to answer any question if you have. Uh, but as you can see, the MANTU is something that we will do at the baseline now. And it is going to be in outpatient setting with the support of our uh, educator. So it is happening and we are saving a lot of money instead of admitting the patients in the inpatients, infliximab will be administered in an outpatient setting. And we are measuring the outcome. It's so important to know that if things are working well or not. Halfway through the study, the first review showed that the uh, teaching, especially the video teaching, significantly improved the patient's comprehension and followed by all the education that we are providing in our clinic. So take home message would be education. Education and education cannot emphasize that enough. Communicate with the patient and the caregiver and the GPs and the whole team, the multidisciplinary team, and close your patient's follow-up. And it is an ongoing thing to make sure you will not miss any kind of side effects. Very unpredictable can happen anytime. And I have just put some useful links that you may want to try and, and uh, have a look at them. Um, ju just so try and see which one works for you best. And you can, all of you can use them and they're all free to use. I think um, that is it. I will just stop and then send it back to Ernest and that will conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Massey. So that concludes the presentation segment of the webinar. We will now begin our question and answer session by addressing questions submitted during the presentation. And looking at the questions now, we actually have not received any. So please type your questions in the chat box beside the slide. Okay. Um, I have a question in the chat box. Um, hi, Massey. When addressing the key principle of IRAE management, can you specify when should you stop um, if needed the therapy tanks? Well, very good question, whoever asked that. This is a very broad question. It depends on the IRAE. There are, they are really the 
For example, thyroiditis, we do not stop the treatment at all. But if you have, based on the grading that we follow the CT, um, CAE, the common criteria, toxicity for terminology for the criteria of version five. So based on the grading of the toxicity, this is something that we decide do we have to stop or not? You have grade two diarrhea, you will stop the treatment. You have grade two thyroiditis, you will continue the treatment. Do we re-challenge the patients? Yes, we will with a close uh, observation and close communication and decision making with the patients, we will continue the treatment. So uh, when should you stop the IU therapy? Depends on what IRAE you are, you are facing. I hope I answered that question. Please post your questions there. I can read all of them. I don't don't think I have any. Other. That's the only question I can see. Ernest, if you will see any other question. Yes, that is the only question I see. And actually, that was from. Uh, yes, so you're right. That is from the chat box. Okay. Okay. So now, would you would you please just speak up? I would love to hear from you. I know we do have definitely lots of experts in the call. And I would just um, like to either brainstorm, network, and then if you have any comments, thoughts, suggestions, recommendation, questions, I would be more than pleased to answer. So Massey, a new question has come in. Would you recharge patients who have grade three or four IRAE? Absolutely. Not endocrine or skin? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, no. And this is in part of our study that we are not re-challenging these patients in grade three and four will not be re-challenged no matter what, but we are watching them and then uh, see their survival because we will see that with maybe only even one treatment, the patient's T cells have been uh, charged, educated and graduated and doing the job. No other question? Another question has come in through the questions tab. Why, uh, please, why do we need to do a mantle test at baseline? The, we don't do mantle test for all the patients. Uh, okay, I can see now the questions. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, yes, we will not uh, keep coming, keep coming. They are sending questions, I love it. So we do not do man to test for all the patients at the baseline. We just do that for the high risk patients because you cannot talk to your pharmacist. You, they will not uh, let you to give the um, infleximab, the secondary immunosuppressive agent without knowing the patients does not have any history of TB or active TB. So that is very important because it will affect the treatment and that is not at all safe. However, we had one case only during the last two years that we had a, a very grade three uh, diarrhea. And so the patients did not have actually colitis on the scope. And that is very interesting case. Not on, the, not on the scope because we started high dose steroids right away. So the inflammation did not show that in the colitis in, on the scope, but when we biopsied, we saw the inflammation right there. So we did not wait for infleximab. We just started uh, for the man to result for two days, we started that. So it is not safe really to do that, but in, in certain circumstances, you do not want that inflammations to grow and create lesions or holes in the colon or in the small intestine, you will just go ahead and then, uh, and then do that. So for that reason, it is really safe to have it at the baseline. So thank you, and I thank you, you. So it is not a question, it is someone just thanking me. Thank you for being in the call. How can we get a booklet for patient education? Also, are they, they only in English or do you have it in another languages? What a lovely question. Uh, you will all get the package and I will promise by mid-September, everything will be ready. 
and we will share that with, with you. It will be actually the whole immuno, immunotherapy implementation package will be in the public domain of the Osler website. And anyone who wants to have it in their website, just you, you just get the link and put that in your website and get that, print that, give that to your patients. You can also ask the pharmaceuticals to print that for you. That is why they are always very, very helpful. Just ask them, can you print I don't know, 50 copies of that booklet for me. Um, it is just an idea. And then the, the translation, the French translation of the booklet is the plan right now that I'm talking to you, but we are planning to translate that in any other languages that the video is, um, is translated now. But we are growing like at the West, I know we do have a lot of Arabic uh, speaking people, and that is the next goal also for 2020. What about phone call follow-up? Do you call all IO patients every week and for how many weeks or only high risk? We do not, I can definitely not able to call 200 patients every week. Um, mind you, there are so many of these patients are on immunotherapy and I just do not see them. I just see them in the waiting room. They remember me. I don't remember patient number I don't know, two or 10 or 50, but they are just doing absolutely fine. There is no need for me to call them, but whenever they come to the clinic, because we have posted all these side effects in posters that have been created by kiosk program on the rooms, they know about the side effects. The doctor will again re-emphasize the side effects. People that are doing well and they have no questions, we will not see them and we will not call them every week. However, people that you think that they may need a call, I'm educating the patients on treatment. It's really critical to know who is your patient. Such a nervous and anxious patient, I'm starting on immunotherapy and they are just so excited, but also nervous. I will definitely put that in my calendar and give a call to the patients the second day. How did that go? How are you doing? Do you have any question for me? So you are oncology nurses, you know your patients better, but absolutely not. There are so many patients on treatment now and they're doing well and we do not do that. Um, and for 20 weeks, we will call the patients weekly call for high risk for 20 weeks. Uh, if so, what are the criteria to the high risk patients? So I think I had that on the slides. Uh, any IO combination is high risk, any patients with history of autoimmune disease, any any patients with, for example, I had an 84 year old age absolutely is not something that is preventing us to treat the patients. Keep that in mind. Age alone should not be used to exclude your patients from any treatment. 70% of my patients in clinic, they are all above 68, 70. I have a couple of 90s, lots of 80s, and they're doing fabulously well. They are, we are following them closely and they're doing well. If they are elderly with a lot of comorbidities, for example, they have a colostomy. So I will put that patients on a category of high risk because I want to make sure we are not missing anything that patients having colostomy. It will be also inserting to have a presentation with case study. Absolutely, I definitely agree. I have tons of case studies with, with picture, not just about this, myasthenia gravis, psoriasis, um, myositis. These are things that we have seen in the clinic. And I have all those cases. I would, I would love to share those cases. I'm sorry, I think that we will run out of the time if we just want to talk about all different cases, but it will help everyone to understand those uh, cases also and how to manage them. Um, but uh, hopefully one day we can do that.